Good morning, everybody. And as per usual, we're just going to give it a few minutes as I can see you all coming in there now. You're very welcome to our third webinar and we will get started in just a few moments. OK, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to our third webinar this Thursday morning, just ahead of our long weekend. Um, our session today is looking at evidence based decision making. So really looking at how we can add value to the decisions we're making by looking at the information that we have um, or that we can easily get and, uh, and seek out. Um, we're going to hear from Emer Hannan today, uh, Managing Director of Hannan Travel, who you briefly heard about on Monday with Stephen. Um, and we're also going to have a facilitated session with Michael Vosnay, who is an SME owner himself and also a lecturer in the Graduate Business School in Griffith College. Um, so we'll be hearing lots of interesting things from the two of them today. Um, it's great as I look at the attendees to see what are now familiar names appearing. Um, so I'm delighted to see the engagement continuing throughout the three weeks. Um, and again, we still have people joining, so that's wonderful and you're most welcome today. I will remind you that the resources for all of our sessions are put up usually within 24 hours, as quickly as you can, on the Griffiths.ie website on the course page. Um, which you can access from the, the homepage of Griffiths.ie. And again, if you have any questions, do feel free to contact me or Michael via email. It's been great to have some chats with a number of you over the last few days um, and to hear your views, your feedback. Um, and it's, it's great to have that contact with you. So keep it coming um, because we are here to help and we will be adding resources based on the feedback that you give us. OK, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Michael, who's going to kick us off um, and introduce our guest speaker today, Emer, as well. So thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, Eilish. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in the series. Uh, I'm delighted to be involved in this, working with Eilish on the programme. And as Eilish said, uh, I am a lecturer in the Graduate Business School in Dublin, She's doing a fantastic job on this webinar series, Long Griffith College. Um, and also I'm a small to medium sized business owner. Uh, I'm three years in business myself. And uh, before that, I was uh, uh, working in employment um, as a full time employee. And uh, my business is called Radar Insight. So today we're going to be talking about analysis and planning and giving some practical tools and tips to help businesses of all sizes to progress. And we're delighted to be joined by Emer Hannan who is going to be our keynote today. She is the MD of Hannon Travel and has been using data in her business um, for a long time and most recently as well in the current crisis we're in. So with that said, I'd like to hand over to Emer Hannon for the address and we'd also welcome your Q&A throughout. Thanks, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Are we all coping at home? Um, Michael introduced me there as Emer Hannan, um, Hannan Travel. I set it up about 20 years ago and I suppose I'm not a data guru, but I have to, we have to use data. I, in the very beginning, I sort of, when people said to me about data, I've gone, oh no, God, I was terrified of it. Um, I suppose the thing to maintain at all times is don't be afraid of data um, and use it to your best advantages. You forget sometimes where your data is. You can have your data in your telephone, which is just telephone numbers. You can have emails, you can have in multiple sources and I think you just need to sit back and look at what what source of data you have coming in what sources of figures what sources of anything that's coming in that you can compile information and come out with a solution um, I suppose I can start with obviously at the moment where we're using data and we've had to rely on it quite a lot in the last couple of weeks is obviously um, the beginning of March when we started hearing about coronavirus and people were saying, you know, it's coming to Ireland and you're sort of going, yeah, it will, but, you know, we'll be okay. But I suppose the, the wake up call was probably, you know, about the 8th, 9th of March when suddenly people are saying, you know, you need to get your passengers home, you need to get, you just need to make sure you know where everybody is. So the CRM system that we use we were able to use our data analytics to go and create a map of the world and identify where every passenger was of ours was in the world. And by having all the details behind them, like their email addresses and everything, we were able to then to send out a message to them to basically say, you need to get home. Do you need help? Do you need to change your flights? But also we were able to identify with 
the the their employer which is would be our client that we're saying you know you've got 10 staff abroad you've got 20 staff abroad so data was critical to us at the very beginning because we were crisis managing for our clients to figure out where all their staff were at any one time and um, so that works fantastic by by having all that prep work done in advance and, and the systems in place we were able literally just to press a button and figure out where everybody was keep in touch with them and sort of tick them off the boxes once they landed back in Dublin or wherever their home country was. So was that was the crisis management initially on where we use data. Um, and I probably go back to the very beginning. The data you get is only, and anything you do with data is only as, it's only what you put in is, is what you get out. So you have to be very careful on what you are collecting and, you know, look at it rationally and sort of go, do I need all this? Do I need to know, you know, obviously you need to know email addresses, but what is actually going to work? And don't kill yourself. Don't go overkill by collecting so too much that you're just going to be totally swamped. So you very much need to figure out what is important to you. For us, it was basically the passenger names, where they worked and their email address, their telephone number and where they were in the world. So, you know, you don't need anything else. You don't need to know where they live or their home addresses. Are they married or are they kids? that's irrelevant and i suppose when you're looking at doing your plans and collecting your data very much focus on what's useful and what's not and eliminate the what's not so i suppose we got over our crisis we got everybody back um and we continued to get everybody back and then we went into a situation where we had to work with the department of foreign affairs to now start repatriating people so while we had our day-to-day -day clients back we now had a the Department of Foreign Affairs now had a big issue where you have they have travelers, they have agricultural workers down in New Zealand, they had people in Australia, they had people in Lima, they had obviously healthcare people, they wanted to get home, there was people stuck in India. So a bit the next came is they reached out and sort of said, Can you help on the whole repatriation? So again, you know, you sit down and you say, Right, what am I going to do? you're not going to use pen and paper anymore to sort of do a list of repatriate for repatriation. So very quickly in the space of about five hours, I think we put together a repatriation project um, platform and it was really working with local companies and all of us connecting together electronically again, sharing our data. So our very first op option was obviously reached out to eight by eight cloud communications. It was a, it's the, the telephone system that we always use in Hannon Travel and it's always been excellent in the sense that we can figure out, you know, you can see the amount of calls taken, you can see the amount of missed calls, where the calls are coming from, you can figure out um, the length calls, who's taking your calls, the analytics on the 8x8 were amazing. So we, we, we sort of tweaked their system that we were able to work within different countries and we used local telephone numbers so they were able to create a local telephone number for australia new zealand and um, india place like that so we knew where the volume calls were coming from we knew who where our problem was where our passengers were stuck and we were just always able to communicate with them secondly then we needed a payment solution um you know gdpr now we're not going to get people ringing from abroad and basically calling a credit card number out or trying to do a PayPal. We needed one because this was a very, very quick operation. So we needed one point of payment. We needed all the data in one place. So again, we teamed up with Ecom365, which is a credit card merchant solution company. And they in five hours created a URL on our website, um, which you can probably go in and see on hanandtravel.com. So everybody that was being repatriated who confirmed they wanted a flight with their passport details and everything, we were able to send them to, to the URL on, the, on our website to do their payment. But you could put in as many steps as you wanted. So you can put in the country they're coming from, the date, obviously had their payment, but the, we captured their passport details and everything there. So we eliminated, by collecting all this data, we eliminated any errors because it was all in a system that was going to throw us up a report at the end of each day um, and then obviously you know to keep people informed because they're spread out all over these countries there was a social media campaign by the embassies and ourselves between twitter facebook 
um, LinkedIn and Snapchat even and Instagram. So again, we were looking at the analytics to see how how it was penetrating were people getting the message that the government were putting on flights to get these people home and the contact details and then lastly we were then able to go to the airline and say right we need 100 seats we need 200 seats because we had collected all probably the lists and, and understood how many people in our countries in the different countries were looking to get home so it just all worked very, very well. The whole collection of data worked perfect. The phone system, we were able to figure out what countries. Ecom, we had everybody, you know, everybody who paid was all on one list. You were able to pull it up. Social media worked well. Um, and again, the you no know, being able to go back to the airlines with the numbers. So that was on the repatriation. But, you know, I suppose on a day to day working with data at the moment, with remote staff, we've got 30 remote staff or 40 remote, 30, 35 remote staff out there, some part times. So again, you're trying, how, how are you keeping them motivated? Um, you know, it's hard. I can't ring 30 people every day and make sure you're OK. So again, the whole eight by eight system is working fantastic that we're keeping, you know, we're, we can see who's on, who's off, who's everything like that, you know, and even managing going forward are we busy because obviously the travel industry is dying and we can see like the amount of calls we're getting every day we can see the length of time the engagement on the calls and stuff and it also it's it's helping me engage like if somebody hasn't had a call or hasn't been online for an hour or two you can actually just go back and say to them look is everything okay um everything okay do you need a hand are you stuck so it's really by watching the analytics of the phones and everything it's it's really helping and and microsoft teams is another analytic we're using at the moment and another form of communication and that's all working very well to make sure that everybody's okay so i suppose in times of crisis like this and crisis management you are very much depending on what you're seeing in black and white on a piece of paper to ensure that you know everybody is okay you can verify your figures by saying we have everybody home or we've got 500 passengers coming home from New Zealand or Australia or something like that. And we can produce reports at the tip of a button for the different people involved, like DF, the Department of Foreign Affairs wants to know how many we got out of Australia, say up to two o'clock today. You can tell them, you can give them the name of the people that have come because that they'll cancel it off their list and then we know who's not communicating. So it's just critical to have all these tools in the background that you're not using an Excel spreadsheet on a piece of paper or and a pen that you are having live information. Um, other ways where, where data is coming in very handy for me at the moment is um, just basically trying to negotiate between salaries and um, you know, budgeting and forecasting. And obviously there's a huge drop in our turnover. There's a huge drop in revenue, but you know, we're able to slot in basically what what our parameters were what the figures we want to get to and the data will just analyze that all in the background and we'll throw out the figures that we want so it's very handy when we're coming to do a lot of um you know manipulation or, or trying to find that magic figure at the end i suppose you know i'm probably talking quite quickly here but if anyone has any questions or nothing's making sense please at the end of it um reach out to us with a question or you know reach out to us later on um and then I suppose we're going to have to sit down. We're sitting down when the whole repatriation panic is over and we get people back. Um, we've got a flight on Sunday from New Zealand taking back another large chunk of people. And once that's over, it'll be restarting. And, and you know, how do we get a travel industry, a travel company back up and running? And um, are people going to fly? Do they feel safe to fly? Airlines will open up. But, you know, are people actually going to be, feel safe to get on an aircraft? And um, corporates will probably come back quicker than leisure because, you know, we don't even know what what hotels or anything is going to be open in the holiday resorts. We just really don't know at the moment. So I think, you know, restarting is going to be it's going to be a huge challenge to us, but it's also going to be the data we have is going to be superb because we're going to have data there from people that should have gone on holidays and didn't. How do we communicate with them? Do we go out to them with an, an email? Do we go out to them via MailChimp? Do we go out to them personally, reach out to them and sort of say, what do you want to do? At the moment, you know, we're trying to establish well, what way will we reach out to different clients? Because I don't know if your inboxes are the same as mine, but 
three, you know, you're getting umpteen emails from C CEOs of every company that you ever dealt with talking about COVID. And I think we're all getting fed up reading it and it's not being read. So I think going forward, you very much have to use the data you have as to how are you going to engage with your customers to kickstart. If you're the local flower shop, are you going to reach out and say, you didn't send flowers on Mother's Day, but would you like to send some now that we're all back running? Uh, uh, there's, you know, I think we're all going to have to put our clients into different gaps and decide this is how we're going to reach out to them and restart. Um, it's just how are we going to, like using our data, how are we going to basically just let people know that we're back um, and, and we're back in the market um, and, and we're ready to go again. What's the best form to restart? Um, you know, we have, we use a very good CRM called Salesforce. Probably a lot of the bigger SMEs will use it, smaller ones, maybe not. Um, Salesforce is superb because basically anything that's happening at the moment, we're able to log it in there. So you have a complete um, up-to-date listing on what's happening with every customer, what's happening with every every supplier, what's, what's happening with everything. So that'll be very handy when we're coming now to look at our analytics to, to kick off again in a couple of weeks time. And the question is, do you, do you kick off, do you try kick off today or do you, are you, you preparing your kickoff plan now? And once we sort of have some idea that the market's ready to go, that's when we, we sort of launch it. Um, and at all times, I suppose you have to bear in mind that I say to you, there's data everywhere. There's data on your telephones, there's data on your emails. You have to remember GDPR is huge in the background, right? So if someone's sending you an email, if somebody, you have to make sure that you're compliant with the whole GDPR issue. So I know, Michael, you, we're going to touch on it briefly, but if GDPR is a big question or a big concern of yours as to how you are going to go out to market, maybe go to Eilish and talk to her. She might do a bigger deep dive on it. Um, so I basically will always say when you're analyzing your data, you can have death by data. You can have far too much. You can, you can just get swamped in the whole thing. Um, you just need to very much ask yourself, what data have I got at the moment? What do I need? And is it just a simple tweak, simple, simple tweak to figure out what additional stuff I can get? We just tweaked our website today because we have a big repatriation job on the 12th from Auckland and we have all the dates. We have Auckland the 12th in there. And that will just produce our report in seconds as to say, um, basically, you know, how many passengers we have. Um, so that's really where we're at crisis management. Obviously we're using, you know, we use our data if we weren't in the middle of COVID, but it, we use it very much to negotiate with our suppliers and our clients, um, you know, deals, discounts on particular airlines because we can establish, well, what, what people are, what clients are spending on what particular airlines. You can look at it. Do our clients booking two days in advance, 20 days in advance. You can get fabulous trends from all the data that we use. Um, so it's very important, even when it comes to doing, looking at staff holidays, is can we afford to have three or four staff off that week? What is the trend there? So we very much rely on data on a daily basis to everything we do in the office is mainly driven by data. Um, so really, if anyone is, I hope that sort of gave an insight into what it's like trying to survive at the moment, but how data is helping. Thanks so much, Emer. You made so many good points there during the talk. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, for choosing partners, what advice would you have for choosing partners? You mentioned 8x8 and, and other partners. I think, like, I worked with, I think you need to nearly have a, so not a personal, but feel you can actually communicate with the person, feel you connect with your partners. Because like that, when I worked with, when we had the repatriation job and we turned it around within five hours, we basically sent an email to Noel Morn from 353, um, Ecom 353, and basically he put his team on it straight away. We sent an email to 8x8, Stephen Macker and 8x8, and he had his team on it straight away. So they all knew that they, this wasn't just a cold call. And I really think in times of crisis, you need to lean back on the people that you know will support you and you have a relationship with. They mightn't be the cheapest. And I'm not saying, and you know, we're all the same. Um, I mightn't be the cheapest travel company but you know what when when you need support and when you need help i really think you have to have a relationship 
builds build relationships. It's like trying to deal with Sky. It's, you know, you can't get through to Sky. You can't get through to Vodafone. You can't get through to anybody because there's no relationships there. But if you yes. look at any of the products or any of the success stories from COVID at the moment, if you look at even yesterday, the day before, Avalon Aviation brought an aircraft in from Hong Kong full of PPE stuff and ventilators. That's again back to small businesses and that's again back to contacts. Um, where there was faces to the company. And I very much feel if there's a face to the company you're dealing with, that relationship will always be there. And it will always be there. And you can really value those relationships in times of crisis like now. Um, and I really feel after, after COVID, what's going to happen is you're going to see a lot of SMEs building really strong relationships with people and they will actually glue to them because they will support them at all times. Because at the moment, there's large companies out there who who are dealing with large companies and there's no support services for them at all. Okay. And is it a challenge working on such a global initiative? This is a worldwide initiative that you're working on now, everywhere from New Zealand. And there's also people in South America. I mean, how, how, how is this working um, it would at have the been moment? A challenge. It would have been a challenge if we didn't have the technology and the ability to capture all the information in sort of one area and be able to do the feeds of data from one to the other. And, um, you know, we're very much able to roster our staff on a 24 hour schedule because we want to see where we get the calls to come from, where the amount of people are. So it's worked, you know, it, it has worked seamlessly. It's been fantastic. And it's been a fantastic example of how four, three, four small companies have come together. Um, not even, well, I wouldn't say small, but, um, you know, it's three or four com local Irish companies have come together and we have developed this initiative and we have got everybody home and it's been seamless. And, you know, there, there isn't pieces of paper flying around everywhere. This person's passport, this person's credit card number, everything was done through one channel and it's worked seamlessly. Okay. And we have a question as well in terms of that somebody wants to start with data, but they're afraid about maybe wasting money and time as well on the initiative. So what advice would you have them for being able to start the step-by-step -step process of using data in the business for decision-making? Use Excel, start on Excel. You know, does, ever, does your okay. people capture it on Excel? Start there and, and you know, manipulate it from there and, and decide then like people, I think people, like I know at the beginning, I was terrified of the word data, but it's, you know, even people's business cards that you get, if you're putting them into Microsoft Office, into your, into your contacts, that's data. You're collecting data. So, you know, tidy, I would say, even use Microsoft Office 365 and tidy up everything you have with addresses, telephone numbers, emails, all over the place. Start at the very beginning and put it all in one place. You know, yeah. so you're not going through your telephone. So basically, if you have your telephone and you're in, in the flower shop in Kells, for example, and you have your flower, you, you have your telephone and everybody's telephone number is in that, but you've gone sick. Your colleague's not going to be able to capture that information. So just take this quiet time to dump everything into some type of system that you can capture, whether it be Office 365, something like that, because then it's there instantly for everybody to access. Right. And there's a question in here from an anonymous attendee, just in terms of how would you go about building a relationship and, and driving business with some of the departments that you'll be working with? And how would you um, think creatively to work with different departments in governments or in, in countries? Establish your product, know your product, uh, understand their requirements and talk. Just be honest and say, we have a solution, we can help you. Okay. Okay, that's great. Um, so if there's any more questions, please send them through and we'll answer them as we continue. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Emer. And um, we, might, we might talk at the end as well. Yeah, yeah no problem. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Okay, so now I'm going to give um, a general talk about data analytics trends and also some of the tools that you can use in businesses of different sizes to succeed in the crisis that we're in. So today's talk is all about planning and analysis, but we want to also ask the question, what does success look like? And we very much would appreciate if you would 
write in in terms of your ideas or anything else that you would like covered in this series. Um, we're very open to that. So today what we're going to talk about is a little bit about the current situation, some of the trends in data and business intelligence known as BI. Um, which you might have heard that term being used around. It's simply just to make sense of information. We'll talk about some of the tools that you can use today um, and some tips and then to go into a summary. And again, um, please keep your questions coming in. So I suppose the first thing to say is that um, an SME is a, is a journey in terms of running a business, starting it, moving forward and growing. So many people who've started a business will have done so because they had a passion or an idea that they wanted to pursue. Maybe it was a product idea. Maybe it was a service that they thought would revolutionize the world. And businesses that have continued to grow then have proven their worth. They've taken on new people. In my own business, for example, I've taken on um, two additional colleagues. So the business is growing and it's a great boost to your morale when you can see that happening. But now I suppose at this time, we're thinking about what can we do now and where are we in this crisis? How did we end up in this crisis? And how has it come on so quickly? Essentially, businesses now have shut. Um, the research is showing that one in five businesses is having to make um, staff redundant. And these are all terrible realities that we're facing. But there are some things that can be done during this time to help with planning and moving forward. That's what we're going to talk about today. So I suppose at the moment, Ireland is known for an amazing welcome, the friendliness of people. Um, but at the moment, we're being told that we need to distance ourselves physically, not socially. But we're redefining what Cade Mila Falcha means, 100,000 welcomes. So things we might be asking ourselves is, how do I continue to run my business? And this applies to businesses of all types. We know that during this seminar, we have businesses from large businesses down to small micro businesses that are joining us, which is fantastic. We really appreciate that. So these are questions that you might ask yourself and hopefully today we'll, we'll address those. And how do I reopen my business? How do I continue? And then how do I actually reopen when the time comes and maybe I've lost business or I need to re-engage the customer again? So we're gonna talk a bit about that today. There is some reassurance as well in terms of that um, a report recently from PwC have stated, I think this is very much in line with what Emer was speaking about as well, that it's very important to have domain knowledge um, and to be a business person and not just a data analyst because you really need to understand your business and the customer and the market. And you can use analytics then to improve that purpose. But if you have analytics knowledge on its own without the business knowledge, then it simply isn't enough. So there's a reassurance there. And another thing as well at the moment is that while the, the reason maybe why there's so many business consultants is that problems are usually difficult to identify as a business. Um, but now in this time of crisis, perhaps the problems are becoming more evident and then we can think about solutions to address those problems. So I'd really love to know some of your current challenges that you're experiencing in business. Um, do keep the Q&A coming in and we'll address them as we go through. Some of the trends then to take advantage of at the moment, um, data analysis automation and real time, speeding up real time decision making is a big opportunity. And this goes from a global level to using SaaS products down to using a tool such as Toggle, which I would use in my own business and it simply manages your time. But you can also filter your time by different projects. So you really know what you're spending your time on and you also know what your team are spending your time on as well. And it really helps with uh, the decision making. Another thing then as well is using business intelligence. And for today's session, we actually built a dashboard uh, in terms of understanding who is joining us today. So we really do know uh, the types of businesses that are um, with us and we're aiming to serve as well as we can during this series. Um, but something like a dashboard, for example, in Power BI or in Tableau or in Oracle, these are different uh, enterprise level tools that businesses are using to basically just summarize information into nice shareable chunks and visual appealing visuals to share with the rest of the team for better understanding. It's as simple as that. You're telling a story with information and um, you're not essentially just trying to overload with data as Emer was talking about. You can have too much data, absolutely. But tools like this help to really visualize it and to break it down. 
I want to tell you that data is for you as well. So um, don't think of it just being applicable to a large business. Any business can use data. There are so many resources and we'll discuss those as we go through. But if you think about the traditional decision-making process that McKinsey um, is well known for, uh, this is now essentially an opportunity to engage with customers again throughout these cycles when people are making their decisions and they're looking for information. There are things that we can do, for example, with search engine marketing, running our Google ad campaigns or our other campaigns online through social media that can engage customers and we can gather data to make decisions. So some of the things that you can do, the practical things, and we'll go through, there are lots of tips here. And again, if there's other resources that you would like, please let us know and we can look into develop, developing them. Um, so what you can do is you can look at your social media presence and really um, focus, on, use the time now that may exist. I, to, I completely understand that businesses are operating uh, remotely with a large number of staff and trying to manage that, but do use the tools that are available uh, but however, at this time for maybe smaller businesses, there is time also to focus on your social media presence. If you've just started a business, you now have time to review that and really understand if your message is coming across and to put some uh, time and resource into improving your, your presence. You can also schedule content. We'll be talking a bit about that later on in terms of some practical examples. But think about that in terms of what can I automate um, and also, what can I spend time figuring out before I automate online? Search engine optimization is something that you can work on as well. It is well known that it's a resource intensive task, but it's well worth it for building your brand in the future. So you can look at improving your content online and even using some tools like SEM Rush for um, observing how your content is performing from a readability perspective, from a search perspective, and from a keywords perspective. Um, also, you can observe your analytics. So you can use things like observing your traffic with Google Analytics. You can look at your sentiment. So really understanding how your customers are feeling at the moment and engaging with them directly. While you may not be, be, able, while you may not be able to provide service to them, in some cases, you can engage with them. And then email marketing is another way to engage as well. Do we have any questions so far, actually? We'll just have a look. No, I'll keep going. Um, in some businesses, you may have um, briefs and internal discussions that are happening at the moment in terms of projects that might be coming down the line. And one of the things to ask in terms of analysis and planning is what knowledge do we already have? So as Emer was saying, use the data that you have available. Um, don't overload on it, but you can define your KPIs from that, which are known as key performance indicators, what success looks like essentially, in, if it's in three months or in six months. And these are things that can work for any business. What are your objectives? What would you like to achieve? Um, time for a bit of planning and some dreaming essentially for the future. And then to use some knowledge in terms of what would be applicable to your stakeholders and what is going to help them during this crisis and moving forward. Some of your metrics, and you might have heard about metrics before, there are so many, but some of the things that you can look at would be your levels of engagement, which we'll look at in a second in terms of tools that you can use to measure that. Influencer engagement, so perhaps you're a business that would re re rely on influencers to uh, drive your brand awareness and consideration, how, how likely people are to consider your business. Um, and this would be applicable as well to larger businesses but perhaps businesses that might be using um, somebody as a brand ambassador. You look at your growth and your reach in terms of your website and what you might be doing with your campaigns. And then also what's known as your share of voice, which simply means your share of voice in the conversation that would be happening in your marketplace between your competitors. And tools like Google Analytics calculate this for you and show you. Um, you're also looking then at your conversions online. So is it are people buying online? And I understand that there are some businesses at the moment that simply can't sell or fulfill orders online, but there might be some that can. And this is an opportunity now to re-engage with your e-commerce functionality on your website and plan ahead. Um, earned media sharing is another thing as well in terms of what we can do with influencers or with uh, buyers to promote our business and to um, share the, the message of what we're trying to do. 
And that's also tailing on to organic conversation, which is whereby the product that you put out is so good or the service you put out is so good that other people want to talk about it online. Looking at some of the service, some of the trends then that it would apply to SMEs. So we can use data to understand how to improve the product and service. We can also use it to gain competitive advantage in front of our competitors if we're operating in a very um, fast moving market in, in, for example, a fast moving consumer goods or FMCG market, um, which would be everything from milk to utilities. But we also then can use it to mine customer insights. And if you remember one thing from today, always start with the customer. That's the most important thing. Communicate is the key to success. Communication is the key to success. So at the moment, now is a brilliant time to be using data, be using things like Zoom as we're doing today, or Microsoft Teams to engage with uh, stakeholders or your employees in the business. And when I say stakeholders, it's really anyone who would have something to lose or gain as a result of the decision making. But you might have a business partner, you might have part-time staff. So do communicate with them and engage with them throughout the process and use the tools that are available. And then user experience or UX as it's known is key to a success. So have a look at your website, see if you can improve things with your website, speak to your web developer um, who you may have a relationship with and see if you can re-engage and improve the content that's already there online. Also look at your messaging and see measuring, if you measure sentiment or feedback from customers, you then can get tips in terms of how to improve that messaging going forward to improve the overall user experience. User typically refers to somebody who's going to be viewing your brand online. Then I'm going to talk about some of the practical tools. So I'll spend a little bit more time on this. Um, but again, if there's any questions, I'll stop at the end of this and we'll have a look at maybe some questions that have come in. Um, so what we're going to talk about are just some of the main tools, everything from Google to Twitter. Um, and we've a good bit to get through, so I'll just um, continue now. So. First things first, if you're not on Google My Business, absolutely go on there as soon as you can. It's a free resource. It's brilliant because businesses like yours will appear on Google search in the Google My Business section where you can have a map to your business. You can also have information, product images, brand logos, photos of your staff, your address um, and your telephone number. And typically um, Google My Business will work uh, for you if you have an address and a telephone number. Some virtual businesses may not, be, um, may not be able to use the service. But also within the platform, Google My Business, you have insights about what customers are searching for in relation to the keywords that they might be using online. So as you can see here in the image here, I've got takeaway near swords Dublin. Those are keywords. So people would be using those words to look for your business and Google My Business shows you some of the keywords that customers have used to look for your business online, which you can learn from. You also see web traffic and other engagements as well. Um, you might also see when people are online to match with your opening hours as well. So if you have opening hours that don't fulfill customers' needs, you can also look at those and uh, change those. Google Analytics, which I'm sure many businesses will be familiar with, but for those of you who aren't, I'm going to show you some of the lesser known features maybe in Google Analytics um, as we move forward. So for example, on the main page, you see an overview of the active users on your website. And I know many um, small to medium sized business owners who would look at this page religiously and um, even stay on the page and have it open in the background. And that's great to see. But there's other information that if you delve deeper into Google Analytics that it can reveal that really add value to your business. And I'm gonna show you some of the ones that I really think are great at the moment. Um, so the first thing is in terms of the customer. So you get an overview of your demographics and you can look at this in so many different ways. You can segment it by different groups. I won't go into that today, but if you'd like to see something on that, perhaps we can provide that at a later date. Um, but you can see in terms of here, if you look at the metrics, you've got pages and sessions. So you can see where people are looking on particular pages and break that down by demographics. That's a really useful tool in terms of understanding your audience on those different pages and how to improve the content, which ultimately will result in a better search engine performance. Another thing then as well is the engagement. We all want to drive engagement in our brands. We all want to deepen engagement in our brands. 
So this will tell us exactly in terms of how long people are spending on different pages during the sessions. Um, and we can even see the pages. So it can be very interesting to see if you put a lot of effort into a page that simply isn't driving engagement, then you get an insight in terms of how you can look and how you can improve that going forward. Another thing then as well, which is really nice, is a feature known as interests, which will show you some of the interests of your owners. And this is also available on Facebook Insights, but it, on Google, it's um, brilliant from a search engine perspective because you have such a wide um, bank of data that's built up to show this information. So you can really get to know your customers and what they might be interested in, what they're interested in in terms of affinities, um, if there's other categories that they're interested in, and what they might be looking for online. And then there's another lovely feature as well. If you look at the top right in your Google Analytics section, it has um, a machine learning feature that will show you uh, artificial uh, analytics intelligence. So it's using AI and machine learning to read your data and come up with some useful information. Um, and there's also, um, there's also something called natural language, which works where you would be able to type in a question and the machine will, will give you back an answer. And that's something that's um, happening a lot more in businesses now and across different tools. But in terms of this, there's just some really nice little features here, the questions that you might have that Google is trying to help you with so that you can understand your information. Um, so these sites will be available online afterwards and you can have a look there, but there might be just some key things there that in terms of what are your key products that are driving revenue. If you're selling online, you want to highlight your best sellers, you want to highlight your um, most frequently sought out goods. And this tool helps you to do that, which is really useful. And again, can be applicable to any business from businesses that are using a very large um, platform to businesses that might be using something like Wix or WordPress or Squarespace to operate their business. Now, Google Trends is one that I would use regularly in my own business, and it works very, very well for understanding intent online. Um, outside of my own website. So while we would have seen with Google Analytics traffic that was related to my website, now we're actually seeing general um, trends and general interest among the world and in different countries. So for example, if I want to know what customers in Dublin are interested in, I can look at this um, in that level of granularity or breakdown within this tool, and it really helps. So for example, you can search from anything from Greta Thunberg to um, your business and what, what you want to do. HubSpot is another really nice tool. I would use that as well in my own business. Um, it's great for uh, operating your CRM or your customer relationship management, which means that you're storing information about your customers um, in line with GDPR regulations, of course. HubSpot has features built in to ensure that that, that is happening. Um, and the data that's captured is uh, compliant. But you also have the ability to use it to um, schedule meetings, which I also have on my own website, whereby I had, um, I worked very closely with my web developer. And I would advise as well, small business owners, if possible, to work closely with your web developer, because it's essentially your shop window that you're putting online. And this gives you a great opportunity to have as much functionality and ease of use, user experience, for your online customer. So with this button, if somebody clicks that, they schedule a meeting, they see a calendar, they select a date, they also can see when I'm going to be available or when my colleagues are going to be available for a meeting. And then we schedule the meeting and they come in and meet us in person. Obviously not at the moment, it's all virtual, but um, we hope to be able to meet physically again in the future and no doubt that will happen for us. Um, MailChimp is another really good thing. It's something, again, that we're using in our business um, to send out newsletters. So newsletters should be... Hi, Eilish. Hi, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, you can keep going there, Michael. It's recording again. Okay, perfect. Um, so do we have any questions coming in so far? I might just take a break there, give myself a breather. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I just thought listening to you, I mean, it's really good to hear the practical things that you can look at. And I, I suppose something that the three of us, um, myself, yourself and Emer, over the last couple of days when we've been meeting um, to discuss it is 
the fact that there are going to be such different levels of knowledge um, among the participants. We've got such a large audience um, that it's hard to know exactly where to pitch it. Um, so what we decided on and, and what you're doing um, is giving a really broad overview of the different tools that are available. Um, and I suppose what we really want to hear from people is what they want to know more about and what your particular level in your business is. Um, so please do um, in the Q&A function, let us know if there's something that um, Michael is describing that you want more on. Um, so one of the things we can do are, are, are kind of video recorded demonstrations where Michael can take you through um, the basics of the Google Analytics or MailChimp or whatever of the, the tools that we want. Um, and I think as well, something that's really valuable for me, I mean, I'm also not a data analyst and as Michael knows from other projects that we work on together, um, my level of knowledge in, in some of the technologies is very, very low and um, it can be a little bit frightening or, or I can be very uncertain, I suppose, when working with different things. Um, but things like dashboards, once you get them up and running, they're so simple, they're intuitive and they are a massive resource. And in a time of crisis, what we're all doing and what many of our sessions are dealing with is about how to be resourceful and um, you know so recognizing i suppose this new resource for some of us who, who don't have a lot of experience with it that how important and valuable um, data can be and something emer mentioned earlier that i thought was really really interesting um, was seeing the opportunity in this crisis that whole talk around the area of relationship building and um, so for smes we, you know we might all feel that we're we're under the most pressure that we have the the worst odds, if you like, in terms of survival and, and restarting and getting back on track. But actually, the world and society is probably going to change as a result of this crisis and relationships become key. And we're all starting to see as we're as we're stuck at home and um, we're starting to see the importance of relationships and contact and the personal touch. Um, and I think what Emer described there in terms of picking partners and working with suppliers, working with providers that you trust and that you can engage with. Um, is something that we're going to see across all sectors. Um, so I think that's a really reassuring thought um, for many of us uh, here Absolutely. today. Okay. Okay. So in terms of questions, um, guys, do you keep your questions coming in um, and we'll, we'll look at them maybe at the end as well. Yeah, I think we're okay because in the main, what we're getting is just common saying uh, thanks and enjoying it. So um, great, <laughs> that's <we> good. <laughs> keep going and we'll go back to the questions. Absolutely, then. yeah. No, that's great. Um, loving this organicness to the webinar. So um, MailChimp. So a lot of businesses would have heard about MailChimp um, and I suppose back from when you were in your college days, you might have been using MailChimp to send out surveys. But MailChimp is also um, so uh, prevalent because it's so useful. And it really gives you the opportunity to create newsletters and engaging pieces of content for your business, uh, for your customers. Um, and it is free. And just as a caveat for free tools, you, you, they are free or they might be freemium, which means they're free to a certain point and then you pay for a larger access to a bigger audience or um, something like that. But you invest your time. So do plan ahead and think about what your newsletter might look at before you go into the tool and then try and understand the tool and work with it. So a bit of planning in the background does help. Piece of pen and paper is fine. Um, so you've lots of different features in this, but you can also use it to um, really, really understand some key uh, metrics about the business. So the op uh, about the customers that are viewing your emails. So the open rates, the bounce rates. So sometimes we might send out emails that would bounce if somebody has left a job or if somebody has moved on or if the email address is mistyped. So this tool really helps with that and to understand that. Um, and it helps you to re-engage with your customers and also from a data perspective to give them the opportunity if they would like to switch off emails um, to, to have that, to have that cho choice. Templates are really useful. So definitely have a look at the templates in the tool. There's lots of different, um, different types of templates for different businesses and they give you suggestions as well. So I think it's a really good tool to use and we use that in our own business. Facebook business is absolutely fantastic. Um, I would use that with businesses and with students uh, regularly. It's um, really intuitive in terms of how the platform works. They bring you through their different advertising products. They help you to understand measurement and the insights that you can gain. 
and it's uh, done in a really visual way where you can actually see your brand in situ. Um, one of the lovely new features on it um, that I came across recently is the Creative Hub. And I think now in this time of remote working, uh, when we're working together, brainstorming or working creatively on content for our site and for our social media, that we can actually work together using tools like this uh, Creative Hub to give each other feedback on the different types of um, messaging or visuals that we'll be using. Um, so it's a lovely way to sort of um, almost whiteboard our ideas. This is just a shot of the um, tool. And as you see, you can see your brand in situ as it would appear in the ad um, on, the, on the tool. And I think that's a lovely feature in, in Facebook that it shows you how your brand would appear. So you really get an understanding and you're brought on this journey before you ultimately decide to run a campaign. And there's so many different formats that you can choose from. Photo would be um, one of the more popular ones. There's also Facebook Insights uh, and Facebook IQ. So Facebook have um, a large IQ section um, in their business. Um, that's also operating out of Dublin as well, but they have um, different insights that would be available for business. It's something that would be along the vein of Think with Google, uh, which is another great resource, but it has um, articles that would be related to your category or to your business. And you can actually filter as well to find more specific uh, results that might be available, to, might be applicable to your business. Um, this is a shot of the audience tool that you'll see in your Facebook business manager. And what it does is it allows you to understand your audience across their location, but also things like what pages they would like. And you can filter by age group and gender um, and interests. So it's very targeted and very personalized. And as we know in marketing, uh, and the session of marketing will follow, personalization is key. And data can really help with that. Instagram analytics. Now, this is something that there's really no excuse not to be using. Um, if you have an Instagram account with your mobile phone, you can observe the analytics right on your mobile phone. And it's so intuitive and easy. I think once you have over 100 followers on your business page, you're able to then see the analytics. So you can see where people are following you from, what content they're engaging with, what time they're engaging with that content. Uh, and how your posts are performing. And if you're engaging in paid, uh, paid social media, you get additional insights. So it's a really good one to use. And again, there's lots of resources to look at. Do consider um, doing Facebook's Blueprint course. It is essential to, it, it is equivalent to a, a Google Analytics um, course or a Google, Google course that would be something like Digital Garage, which is a fantastic course that I've taken myself and I definitely recommend, again, free to use. Uh, it's just your time that you would invest in it. Twitter, don't dismiss Twitter. Um, I come across a lot of um, students and young, younger people, it's hilarious to say that, but uh, younger people that um, may not even use Twitter, but Twitter definitely is a, is a place where audiences exist for SMEs. Um, I would attend a lot of industry events and the conversation mainly happens on Twitter. So Twitter is brilliant because it's so short in the hundred and I think 130 characters that you have, might be wrong on that, but it allows you to get sentiment messages really clearly across because you don't have a large amount of text to try and decipher either as a human or as a machine, because a lot of um, machines will use what's known as natural language processing to figure out what sentiment people are using. Uh, but a human can do that much better. So I would uh, advise you to have a look through your Twitter feeds and to pull sentiment. And some of the things that you can do, for example, are create simple word clouds. So this was one that I looked at last year. Um, I might give a virtual prize to anyone who can guess what it's for, but I'll tell you anyway. It's um, basically when we had the water boiled water notice last year. So this would be another crisis, obviously not at the same level, but um, it does get across the sentiment in keywords in a word cloud there. Um, in terms of some of the inconvenience that people had or maybe using their dishwasher and whether they actually had to um, clean dishes a second time when they were in the dishwasher and maybe looking at some of the areas as well where people were experiencing the difficulties. So again, this might be something to show to stakeholders in your business or to your colleagues uh, if you have a large uh, following on your Twitter or you want to understand how people are engaging. I can see there's a good few questions coming in there, so that's great. Um, 
the another thing then as well that I personally love doing and that I would have used, uh, I'd say would have been one of the first businesses to use this um, in, in the industry, but emoji mapping is fantastic. And I've seen larger uh, companies such as um, social intelligence platforms using this now nowadays. But what it does is it allows you to understand how people think and feel when they can't maybe express themselves through words. And this is particularly um, re relevant to younger audiences where they would use a lot of text chat or they might use emojis. And it doesn't make it any less relevant or any less important. Um, and don't think it's unprofessional or anything. This is where everything is moving towards. And you can actually analyze this sentiment in tools. So for example, here you can see that People loved the, um, they loved this. This is actually for an event that happened in um, the Tower building where I work, where my office is. Um, and it was people loving the event, but also they were commenting about creativity and that there was diversity at the event. So these are things that you can drill down into without having a, a word map essentially, um, but you can understand through the emotions. Some practical tips. Might have a look at some questions um, after this. Some practical tips then I would say are master one tool at a time if you can. Uh, start with a tool and really get to know that and do delegate in your business in terms of having others to explain the tool, do lunch and learn sessions, uh, which we all love. But those, that's a really good way to approach it. Start with one thing and become the master of it and then move on to the next don't essentially magpie between tools. I'm guilty of doing that myself. Curiosity is great, but when you get bogged down into a tool, it can really have an effect uh, on you. And you might just say, I'm not gonna bother with this and move on. But do try and master it. Delve into online resources. There are so many, HubSpot Academy, Facebook Blueprint, Google a Digital Garage, and Google My Business Courses. They're all fantastic. There's training nearly on every platform because they want you to use their platform and it's in their interests. So do check it out. Do research terminology that you don't understand. There will be a lot of terminology, perhaps uh, different metrics and things that you don't understand. And personally, myself as well, I would always research uh, terminology that I don't understand to have the right information to give. Um, never be afraid to ask for help. Learning never stops you always learn and um, it's brilliant to grow your knowledge in this area using tools like hubspot for scheduling your appointments for customers so for example if you're a hair salon and you'll have to have closed at the moment because of social distancing but you might be able to schedule content and sh schedule appointments going forward in two or three months that can be rescheduled again if they need to be but do use the tools that are there um, with that button feature I was showing earlier on, that's very useful to be able to um, build a rapport and build an ongoing engagement with your customers. Um, another thing then as well, if you're a makeup artist, it's the same similar thing. With B&Bs, you might want to uh, measure your bed nights in the, ho in, the, in the accommodation or if you're a hotel, similarly, use data tools for that um, and do try and schedule things in advance. Uh, this is unrelated, but music artists will pre-schedule the release of their music well in advance. And sometimes the date may not be exact, but they're still using the technology to do that. So why not use it if you're another type of business? It's very relevant. And this also would go for restaurants and gyms. And we know that restaurants have been on Twitter recently commenting that they've lost an awful lot of business. So it's an opportunity to use the technology that's there to build a plan going forward. Um, and as we learned yesterday in terms of crisis communication, have your crisis plan and do include data as part of that plan as well. Facebook analytics and Instagram analytics on mobile phones, they're making it easier than ever for you to engage with your information and data. So do use it. And then Google My Business in terms of if you have a physical address and a telephone number, it's free to use. And what it means is when people Google either your business or they Google a term that your business is ranking for, so for example, in my case, it would be marketing consultant or strategic consultant. I am then showing on the right-hand side of the Google page or in the center, depending on the browser, and my information is there and people can engage directly. They're brought onto my website and then they can book a meeting. It's, uh, it's all a real seamless process. And then in terms of research, so um, in my own business, the R in radar stands for research. And um, 
I love research and I also love technology. So it's really a merge of the two together. And I think that that works really well in this instance to have your surveys or your focus groups online with your customers through Zoom or through Skype or whatever tool you want to use. But you simply just can send uh, surveys and you can have conversations with customers online. It doesn't matter that it's not face to face. You can still use technology and it can still be very engaging. And just remember as well at the end of the day that you're in control of what you're capable of doing at the time. Don't feel overwhelmed. Take one step at a time. And then just in summary of what I've talked about today, just to keep it simple, you can also look at um, improving, now might be a time to look at improving your SEO, your search engine results. You can use sites online such as Moz or Search Engine Land for finding information. And as I was saying, SEM Rush have some brilliant tools online. You're able to sign up for free trials or you can invest uh, in, a, in a larger subscription if you wish but there's some really interesting tools and technology out there to help you on your journey. So I really hope that that was helpful and uh, we'll go back to questions now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. That was absolutely brilliant. Really, uh, really interesting to hear. Uh, there's a lot of questions, so I'm glad we've plenty of time for questions. Um, and I'm not sure if Emer is um, available to join us. I think some of them she, she would, uh, have interesting input on as well. Um, sorry, I'm going to do a screen here for a second because we actually got a question uh, from Patrick who's joining us. Hi, on I'm here. Hi, Emer. How are you doing? Hi, Emer. Um, so Patrick on YouTube was wondering, and I think this would be very applicable to all of us really and for our participants to consider as well, will you change your work practices post-COVID-19? Um, I know that's something I've definitely been thinking about. I, pre the crisis, I would have done a bit of remote working um but certainly I, i'm doing it all the time now and, and different types of remote working so i never would have uh, met with students or or lectured or taught from home before and, and now that's our reality so for me the answer would definitely be yes i'm thinking a lot about how i work and how i balance family um, and, and life as well as work so i don't know um what in, do you yeah. think guys in my I, case i would have said that um I would have followed the Steve Jobs philosophy, which is when you give somebody a task to do, trust them without watching them all the time. So I give, um, I have a conversation with people I work with and ask them what works best for them. And at the moment, we, we all work remotely, of course, but I think in the future, we work remotely when we can and we meet up then. Don't need to be beside each other all the time. Um, my work practices have definitely changed. We're looking at building communications with the customers that we have and prospects as well that we've built relationships with. So we're putting out things like newsletters. We're engaging uh, more on social media and looking at auditing as well, uh, our channels. Great. And Emer, that's a, a massive question for you, really, with such a big team. I, I think there's huge potential for very small SMEs. Um, going forward when we come back after COVID-19 I feel a lot of companies are going to basically build their businesses on building jigsaws and not have like contracting in an accounts team contracting in a marketing team contracting in an IT team so they're not going to have the staff on their books so if we face another crisis like this it's a very easy switch off so I see huge potential out there for come for for small smes to go in and again go back to the relationship bit to go in and provide services to larger companies but when a crisis starts they can just click them off so even just use Aer Lingus for example um someone provides the catering somebody somebody contracts the crew in somebody contracts the you know the air air, air stewards in somebody contacts in the reservations team but essentially the business is there but everything else is just clicked onto it so there'll be a lot of contracting now and i do believe that you know full-time pensionable employment is maybe going to be a thing of the past set up your own pension i i <laughs> look, I, I set up my own pension i know that's off topic but i it's, it's, it gave me a great um sense of like achievement to have set up my own pension but I said the, the smaller SMEs should just jump to that now because every company is thinking when we come back, how are we going to be leaner and how are we going to switch this off again? How are we going to keep our businesses going again? Um, so if they can just have a case where somebody else will switch off, it's easier to run a business. Yeah, 
I yeah. think it was Peter yeah. Drucker that says said that marketing and innovation is the only core thing for any business that really a lot of the activities within a business as you say you can outsource and you can you can bring in the expertise from different places and um, so looking at what your core values are and your core skill set and um, is a really good starting point for companies in terms of their, their future growth yeah. yeah thanks for that and thank you patrick on youtube for that question and um, next question in then from ray who we're, we're back into zoom now uh, so ray is a sole trader and he's interested in, in starting to use more of these these tech um, areas and get more involved in using technology so what would be the good place to start? And um, so we're talking ground zero here. If you're if you're starting in ground zero in terms of level of knowledge, but willing and eager to learn, what would you recommend as a starting point? I think Emer, you'd mentioned Excel yeah. earlier, but um, <laughs> anything else that you would? Well, I, I just say gather your information. Um, you know, take it off your telephone. If your phone breaks, take it off. Like this is very, very basic stuff. But look around and sit at your, like what do you transfer from one diary from one year to the next? Why are you transferring it? When you get your, you know, why isn't everything in the cloud? What happens if you are sick and you're trying to run your business? How is anybody going to get access to information? And I think in times like this where we are quiet, while we're all wondering when we, would our business survive? How will we take our business to the next level? How will we restart it? Guys, there's lots of housekeeping we can be doing at the moment. And there's a mass, you know, in, in the sense of tidying up where you're collecting everything, you know, be it the plumber, where's his list of, of contacts? Mrs. Ryan, Mrs. Byrne is on his telephone, but. You know, he, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? There's huge Go amount on, of yeah. things they can be doing. Even I, I would say, yeah, yeah. I, I would say to Ray, um, look at the Google Digital Garage course on um, the YouTube page. It's fantastic and it brings you through um, search engine marketing and all of the Google tools from the very beginning. It's a really nice foundation. Um, and then do stick with one tool at a time if possible. Yeah, that's good advice. And what we might do, yeah. Michael, maybe is include the link to that course um, on the online resources as well on Absolutely, the website. Yeah. So just, yeah. just to signpost it to people. Um, so yeah, I think that's really good advice. Just keep it simple, pick one, um, and, and you'll build your confidence as you go along as well. Yeah. Um, now, Vincent has a question, which I think you might have answered um, afterwards then. It was when we had the, the small disruption um, with, the, with the sound and recording. Um, he was just saying... Um, did he he missed what Mailchimp was is when the sound stopped, um, so I think you then when you went back into your presentation, um, you you kind of went through Mailchimp. But if you've any specific and, and, questions yeah. on that, Vincent, add them again. An email marketing tool, Vincent, basically that allows you to personalise messages to customers. Okay, great. Um, and then one from an anonymous attendee uh, saying thank you. It's difficult to do to fully do SEO. Uh, search engine optimization on Wix template website. So have you any tips on that, Michael? There might be a plug in on the Wix um, back on the back end. In WordPress, for example, there's Yoast, um, but there might be something similar on Wix where you can get some feedback on your content. But you could also use the SM, SEM Rush content tool that's on their website. Uh, where you can just basically copy and paste in your content and they give you some recommendations uh, against keywords that you want to rank for. Okay. Hope that helps. Great. Yeah. Very practical. That's great. Um, and uh, then we have, yeah, a question. And, and Martin, it's a very it's a very valuable question. I know both Emer and Michael did, did reference it when they were talking earlier about how do you deal with using MailChimp or newsletters and emails, basically contact any contact um, against this restrictive GDPR data protection background. Um, and I think, I suppose it's important for us to say we're not, we're not speaking as data protection experts, um, but in terms of general advice of, of how you, you negotiate that or how you manage that, that tricky path, have you any tips yeah. or advice? Refer to the Data Protection Commissioner website and the EU Commission guidelines on that. Generally speaking, if you have a legitimate interest to contact somebody, that is possible. So um, if it is a customer that is on your mailing list and has agreed to be on that mailing list, uh, you are able to contact them, generally speaking. 
and you give them the opportunity then to unsubscribe if they wish. Emer, you're on mic, sorry, I'll just add, unmute you there. I think the most important thing is to make sure that you have the permission of the person to retain their details like their email address. But I do think for the smaller, you know, individual, single people, single in companies, very small SMEs, there's huge support around GDPR within your local LEOs, within your local enterprise boards, they will have information that will help you. Because I know people can get scared of the word GDPR, are you a processor, are you not, are you a data collector, are you this or that. Um, it's basically, I would say, make sure you have permission from the person to retain their details, but reach out to your local, you know, your local enterprise boards on the smaller companies or your Leos and they, they might give you, they might even run a one day course you can attend. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think we had a GDPR question on Monday, if I'm not mistaken as well. So again, if it's something you think um, you would need some additional information on, we can look at that as a specific resource uh, separately. So do let us know if GDPR is something that is still an ongoing challenge for you. Um, from a marketing perspective, which is which is my background, I suppose, um, in terms of um, having that permission, I suppose key to it is is doing something or having your messaging um, as engaging as possible so that your customers do want to hear from you and they are giving you permission and they are happy. Um, you know, so again, this notion of relationship, one of my favorite words, that they actually um, are going to read your email because they know it's going to be pertinent, they know it's going to be concise, they know it's going to give them something valuable um, because they trust you and they have that background um, knowledge of your business. And um, so as well as complying with legislation, think about why you're contacting them and, and what they want to hear. You know, as Michael said earlier, the customer being at the center of everything you're doing. Um, another anonymous question then here, um, it's great, all the questions coming in. Um, yeah, and this is, a, I think, really interesting and it's something I, both Michael and Emer will probably contribute to. I mean, Emer, you were talking about all the different partners um, and different agencies that you have to, to work with. Um, and obviously there's, there's a lot of compliance issues for your business as well. Um, but this um, attendee is saying there is so much data out in the marketplace, but also being able to combine what's out there with your internal data um, can be really, really helpful. And I suppose that's, it speaks to what you were talking about, Emer, but also Michael in terms of bringing in the, the wider data trends into your business. Um, so he's just seeking your thoughts, I suppose, on how you go about that, that integrating external data with your company internal information. We just have a, oh, sorry. No, we, just ahead, have, sorry. we just have a, a Travelogic system, which is called Travelogics. We take API feeds. So we take API, external API feeds in. So that gets quite complicated when it's, you know, obviously we're big, we're, we're large enough SME. So it's taking, we're taking external feeds through APIs. Um, and that's how we gather all our data into one place. It's like a, it's like a mixing bowl and we just take it, everything in from different areas. Probably not going to answer the question, Michael, you might have a better. How do you bring in external data to work with your internal data? So to integrate it, to combine both external and internal data. Well, in some instances, it depends on the size of the business and if there's a need for it, essentially, if it's, if it's important to do, if you have the capability to do it as well. Um, but you would be able to sometimes merge data sets, just large information in columns, for example, in an Excel sheet that then can be uploaded into the likes of Tableau or Power BI or Oracle Cloud or lots of other tools, there's SaaS tools, lots of different things. Um, and you would also be able to do things then as well in terms of analytics outside of say your google analytics where you would be mining information online about your business that you wouldn't essentially be um controlling or owning but it comes from your customers and from a general audience okay great thank you um both now i think um this one i suppose the next couple of ones are, are probably more towards you michael and, and maybe uh, calling a little bit on your marketing background as well as uh, the, the <laughs> data side of things um, and we do have sheena and Orla and Anne coming up next week, um, or sorry, the week after next, with a, a marketing session as well. But it, it might be relevant here, so I'll ask. Martin sure. is asking, is there a particular reason or advantage for a private investigation or surveillance company to use Instagram? So they already have a company website, they have Facebook, they have a Twitter presence. Should they be doing all the socials? No. 
uh, it's what is relevant for your audience. So if you're a surveillance company, it depends. Are you selling products on, on, on your, are you selling cameras? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it depends what, what's relevant to the audience. That's, that's really it. Um, they, and also your competitors, are your competitors using other tools? Are your competitors using Instagram? And um, there might be a reason why they're not. You, you could consider using it and trialing it and see how it performs, but focus on where the audience is. Okay, great. Uh, Martin said he's not selling, no. So he's not selling products. So it is a service business, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. So as well, what you could do is if you're a service, then typically video tends to do really well. So uh, Facebook and Instagram work quite seamlessly. So you would be able to post content on your Facebook that would then be put on your Instagram or vice versa, one of those. But video content is, is very good on Instagram. It works really well in, for example, Instagram stories and IGTV, if you have a little bit more time or if you're running a series of content then. Okay, great. And the, the next question actually follows quite nicely from that from Michelle, um, talking around the area of Instagram lives. So her, her business is um, Pottery Events. Um, and she's noticed that some competitors in the paint space are doing live or virtual events. Um, she's a bit wary because obviously you need clay in order to do pottery, so people mightn't have it at home. And she'd also be maybe opening herself up to competitors, seeing what she's doing, and maybe giving away um, her USP or her, her unique way of doing things. Um, so would she be, is that, what, what's your thoughts on that? Is she giving away too much? Is it a, you know, is it going to not work because of the, the, the things people need? I, I don't think so. I mean, that's a, that's a common thing that, that uh, business owners feel threatened maybe. And, but if you, if you are an expert at, at your craft, which I'm sure you are, put up a tutorial for people online. They're looking for inspiration and entertainment at the moment. Uh, in between all the other things that are happening. So they would, would love to see something like that. Um, that sort of content is content that people really want to engage with outside of work as well. So I know, um, for example, um, one of uh, my, my colleagues um, would be running a business. I think it's called, it's called a makery and it's um, furniture up, up, um, up, what would you say? Ups, up, like basically repainting and redesigning furniture from maybe unique materials and things like that. And um, a, an Instagram feed or an Instagram video would be brilliant for, for showing customers. Show and tell, show, don't tell. Yeah. yeah, actually that's a great idea. So it could be, you know, you could pivot it to something that they would be able to easily do, but also just for pure entertainment, just showing um, would be really interesting for them as well. So yeah, a great, great one. Um, a, a practical question um, on HubSpot for you again, Michael, and then we have another um, another one coming up that um, Emer might engage with as well. It's a, it's an interesting one in the tourism sector. But just on HubSpot, Mary is wondering, um, on using HubSpot for appointments, how does it work? Do customers have to sign up for HubSpot or sign up for it? No. So as you were saying earlier on, if you have a button or some functionality on your website, I mean, that, that is fairly straightforward to add. I think some of the platforms have that as a plugin, which is just a download, like an app that you could add on your WordPress or your Wix or your Squarespace. Um, and then what happens is when someone clicks on that button, they go to a calendar and it has your appointment availability there. I actually um, set that up through uh, HubSpot myself. I didn't put the button on the website, but I set up the functionality. So you simply just go to the marketing function on HubSpot um, and I think meetings, and then you can schedule it from that. And it's really intuitive. Brilliant. Yeah. So it's integrated and it's not customer facing and, and yeah, so that it doesn't interfere with them in any way, I suppose, is Mary's concern. Not at all. No. Yeah. No. Great. Okay. So this one is not so much a question, but just an interesting anecdote. And we're, we're talking about, uh, Emer was talking about thinking creatively about how do you, how do you reorganize your business and what we do next? Um, and this particular um, business, a family business of pubs, uh, based in the Canary Islands, entirely dependent on tourism. Um, and they're in very strict lockdown for over three weeks now. So there's zero tourism stance um, in place. So what they've started doing, and I suppose this is more inspo than necessarily a question, they've started doing live gigs with their resident musician online with Facebook and have had a phenomenal response of people joining. Um, and I suppose it's that 
question of community. Um, you know, people are stuck at home, they're looking for a distraction, they're looking to be entertained. Um, and while it's not going to be revenue generating for them, it's generating good feeling and good connection. Um, so that once we get to the stage where we get going, they've got that engagement. Um, and that's kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about managing your message so that people want to hear from you. It sounds like they're really, really um, supporting and being could seen they, as friendly. Could they not do a virtual pub, twenty not 24 seven, but yeah. could they not do a virtual pub um, like during pub hours, whereas they have something like Zoom, which I know there's a time there's something, but they've got something like that where people can just zoom in and, you know, click in and click out. So if you just want to check in with who's in the pub, and they're like house party, but or whatever. Yeah, do their they're own version do, of it. You know, they're, while they're doing their gigs, I think we're all going for walks. We're listening to music. I think we're going demented reading. We're going. It's actually social interaction is what we need to be able to talk to other people. So, um, I would have my virtual pub going. Yeah. You know, with with just with the locals that do come in and or foreigners. Uh, I yeah. presume I probably need to legally say always drink responsibly after that. <laughs> <laughs> I was at an online table quiz. It was great fun on Instagram Live. Uh, that's a brilliant channel for table quizzes, actually. Yeah. 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 So again, it's about just thinking differently and engaging with people differently. Like mm. Easter, Easter's coming up, so something on Saturday night. Like, I know, I know some of my guys ask, could they, could they just go next door to the rugby club and rent it for an hour and two people at a time just go in to sit at a bar? But I think virtual. Um, you know, if it's the, if it is actually nearly where they go to, I would do something virtual. The music is great, but they need people need interaction with the locals that come in as well. Okay, brilliant. Um, a question from Paula then. So Paula is wondering, Michael, if you could just pick, if you could pick one tool, uh, a marketing tool. Um, Paula is looking to promote a business textbook. Depends where the audience is. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. Customer first, please remember that. That's the most important thing. Where is the audience? Um, the tools, so I mean, the obvious ones are going to be Facebook and Google. Um, but for example, like if you have an ability to show people a video of you reading through the book or sharing some content through the book, then Instagram is a brilliant channel for that. Um, and if you want to engage with media, then Twitter is a great channel for that but it depends where your audience is and look at your competitors as well. And I suppose as it's a business textbook as well, there might be opportunities on LinkedIn to have that engagement. Absolutely. Well, who, who's the customer? Is it the, is it students or is it the other businesses that are going to be buying that textbook? I suppose your, your key audiences there will be students or uh, educators, wouldn't it? It'd be, it'd be yeah. as well. So you might have a number of tools you need to use to reach all your audiences. Okay, and then we feedback for Ray saying uh, to that your local LEO will have a, a lot of quick courses as well. And um, so that was referencing uh, Ray's earlier question. I think Emer said that as well on the on the GDPR side. Um, Sinead has a question here. If you have your own mailing list, um, for example, Hotmail, and have mailed them in the past, um, is that okay? I think that goes back to your question of legitimate interest, Michael, doesn't it? Yeah, you need to provide in what's known as informed consent. So people know what they're signing up for and that they agree to it. And they have the ability to remove themselves then if they wish. So typically there's a one button unsubscribe feature in most email platforms. Okay, perfect. Um, so we have another question for Michael, a small self-employed retailer. I do not have an online presence at the moment, but hope to get up to speed with it. Where would I, how would I go about getting started with setting up a website from the beginning? I think you've mentioned some tools already, but you might um, expand briefly on them. Ultimately, they would love to have a decent e-commerce website set up shortly. They've domains bought, but they just don't know how to go about the rest. It's a little bit overwhelming, which I think is how a lot of us can feel sometimes mm. at the start of this, this uh, journey with technology. Well, I mean, knowing the difference between your domain and your hosting is, is, a, is a first learning when you're setting up your own website. I would say anything that you're not comfortable doing yourself, look to delegate and look to have some help and some expertise on it. Web developers um, are readily available at the moment. Um, if you have a couple of, if you have a couple of hundred quid, you can, I mean, I don't know, this is generalization, but if you have a couple of hundred quid, you can definitely get some advice or maybe even some 
general build on your website or if you have any um, ex-colleagues or ex-coworkers who could help you with it. Um, starting a website and building a website from scratch can be challenging. Yes, you can build a, a general platform, but then in terms of how it works and how it appears, that can be challenging. So you, some, one of the most basic things is responsiveness. The screen resizes to the device you're looking at. So if it's a mobile phone, and if that isn't set up properly, it can really mess up the website. So really do look to um, look to look for help and look for some advice or a put a little bit of money into uh, working with someone to build your website. Depends what it is as well. If it's product, definitely, because you're showcasing your products online. With services, there's a little bit more that you can do around content or maybe articles that you can write, blogging, that kind of stuff. Okay, great. Um, and Emer, from the non-techie perspective, the, as someone who was once in their shoes of trying to figure out what, what your website should or should be or shouldn't be, do you have any tips? Keep it simple and don't overkill with text. Yeah, I think that's very true in terms of... And just people won't read text and, and, and anything, even if you're doing a LinkedIn thing, or the most, if you, even if you're doing a video, 90 seconds is the maximum attention time you're going to get anybody. So I would say, Keep it simple, graphically nice, and don't don't kill by text. Yeah, that's the good. majority of the time people will just go to your landing page to get your contact details, just to see if you exist and to get an idea. They don't read half it. Yeah, I think that exactly you're right. They're they're there to see that you're credible, that you're real. Um, it's almost a, an assurance for them. Um, so and Google nice. Google my business really helps with that. Just to interject, Google, Google My Business definitely helps to show that you're a real business because they have that verification process. They send you a link to make sure that you're uh, who you say you are. So that's another really good way outside of your website. Yeah, and I definitely, you know, in personal use, when I'm Googling for something, that's, they're the companies that I would look to. I would always be yeah. uncertain of one that, that isn't um, kind of verified, so to speak. Okay, that's brilliant. I mean, that's all the questions we've got in now. We're, we're mostly just getting uh, thanks and that was a great help messages, which is nice to hear. So thank you very much. And um, we've covered a lot today. And, um, you know, so we appreciate there's a lot of information there and um, that that we've gone through. And um, so as always, please do feel free after the webinar has ended to get in contact with us um, directly via email and we'll answer any queries that you have. It's lovely to hear from you. It's been great chatting to some of you during the week. Um, and equally, if there's anything in particular for Emer, um, we can get back in touch with Emer and we can let her know if there are any other follow-up questions as well. Um, the other thing I'd remind you is that within the next day or so, um, allowing for the fact that we're now entering the long weekend, but certainly very soon, um, the video um, of this webinar will be up on the website. So if you felt there was too much in there or you got a bit bogged down in some of the stuff, you can rewatch, you can pause it, you can take your time and digest the information um, over a longer period of time. So, um, you know, it's going to be there for you as a resource into the future. And um, so all that remains for me to say really is thank you very much for your time and for the considerable insights that you gave today, guys, both Emer and Michael. It was really, really valuable. And um, that, that's the most engaged I've seen people in terms of um, really just wanting practical tips and, and using your knowledge and your insights. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, take care, everyone. Um, we, we won't have another webinar until next um, Wednesday. So uh, to allow for the bank holiday Monday, you should have been informed of that in your email with the registration link. Um, so you have a few days to digest everything you've heard this week. Um, we're delighted to have you with us and we look forward to seeing you next week again. So take care, stay safe and have a lovely weekend.